Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, Momlo Summit uh, Q&A session. Uh, before I get started, just a really quick one, uh, just some, some housekeeping stuff. Uh, please keep your mics and your, uh, and your videos uh, off or on mute for, uh, for the duration of the session. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box um, to just pop in all your questions uh, as they come to you. Uh, the way we're going to run this is we're going to start with a uh, with just a, an overview. So I'm going to walk you guys through the trip. I'm going to show you some pictures, some maps, just to have an idea of the trip. As we're going through it, just feel free to, whatever question pops into your mind, just feel free to, to drop that into the chat box. And then at the end of that presentation, I'll start to go through your questions uh, one by one. I also have uh, you know a small list as well that I'll go through of frequently asked questions that people don't generally, uh, that people do generally think about um, at some point. Maybe you're not thinking about it right now, but uh, it's just good to get those out there as well. So um, yeah, there we go. So welcome everybody uh, to our uh, Momolo Summit trip uh, Q&A. This is actually probably, for me personally, this is like my favorite because uh, I, I don't know, for those of you who, who don't know me, um, I'm a, I'm a mountaineer as a, as, as by passion. That's something that I, I've always loved to do ever since I was a little kid. And uh, taking people up to the Mont Blanc and being a part of that experience is uh, one of the most satisfying things for me because it's a, it's a great kind of uh, crossover from the world of trekking and 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 high altitude walking into uh, alpinism. And the Mont Blanc just kind of has has it all. Um, I also grew up in, in, in parts of this region, so I really feel like I'm taking you all to, to my backyard and showing you around. So really, it really feels close to home. Right, so I'm gonna start by just kind of walking us through the itinerary um, bit by bit. And, uh, and yeah, so here we go. I will share my screen for a second and hopefully the uh, technology will not fail me. Uh, great, so you should be able to see um, the, the slides right now on your screen. Right, so Mont Blanc with uh, climb with training. So the first point uh, to talk about here is uh, that our, our trip includes the training for the trip. So uh, although it's of course always recommended for people who want to learn to get out there and to take you know mountaineering uh, courses and that's something that we also do, but the Mont Blanc itinerary also includes the training that you need, assuming that you're an absolute novice. So you're somebody who's putting crampons on for the very first time, and uh, and so we include that uh, that element of the training as we uh, uh, you know throughout the week that, that we spend together. Um, the Mont Blanc is actually, of course, it's the summit. It's the high summit that you see all the way in the back that's kind of domed. Um, but you can also see uh, the Mont Blanc is also the massif. The massif means the collection of mountains that are collected together and unobstructed by a valley. valley. So everything that you're seeing in front of you is actually the, the Mont Blanc massif. So it's the, it's the Mont Blanc area. And, uh, and of course, the Mont Blanc itself is the, is the the dome that you see tucked all the way at the back over there. And Chamonix, which is our base camp, uh, where we spend our time together uh, when we're not on the mountains, actually tucked right down the valley just below us. Oops, something has gone wrong here. I'm just going to quickly reshare that. Share. Okay, just a moment. Sorry, guys. Uh, the the presentation has decided that it doesn't want to do what it's supposed to. And I'm just going to give that one more shot. Okay, that should be fine. Let's give that a shot again. Okay. Great. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, just to conceptualize where everything is. Uh, so uh, our, the meeting point for our trip is Geneva. Uh, that's where we pick you up. We take over from there. Um, and we drive up to Chamonix, which is, you can see at the very bottom of the map over there. Um, and Chamonix sits just north of the Massif, although the, the picture is kind of turned around so that, you can, so that we can show everything. Um, the Mont Blanc itself is to the right side of the Massif, and I'm showing you a lot of what's happening on the left side of the Massif because it, it's also where we're going to be doing our training. 
as well as our, uh, as our uh, acclimatization summits. So the summits that we use to kind of get, put our training to the test and get our bodies used to the higher altitude environment before moving over to the Mont Blanc, which is 4,810. It's a pretty big mountain. Um, over here, you can actually see we're on the opposite side of the Mont Blanc, and you can actually see the trail, the summit trail of the Mont Blanc. And it's actually just behind Ziad over there, who's standing, posing for us. Um, just exactly where he is, you'll see there is a, 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 there's a big black pyramid. Uh, that's the Goute Hut. And then you just follow the ridge up the domes until you get to the summit of the Mont Blanc. So it's something that's quite spectacular, as you can see. It's really just one of the most incredible places uh, in probably in the world, uh, definitely in, in any alpine environment. So uh, day one, we, we, we meet up in Chamonix, uh, or actually we meet up in the airport. It's a, it's a shuttle day, so you guys can arrive at any time you like, um, and we'll be taking you uh, from Geneva to Chamonix and getting your gear done, getting your gear rentals if you have to, if you don't have your own. Um, and then we'll have a team dinner in Chamonix, and that's where we're going to all get to know each other. All of you guys will get to meet each other for the first time. And we'll also have our, our mountain guides with us as well, and, and they'll introduce themselves. Um, we'll spend the night in the hotel. The next night, we go to Mer de Glace. Mer de Glace is a, uh, is a glacier, and that's where we're going to do our training. So we'll be leaving Chamonix, taking the mountain train up to Mer de Glace, and then going down to the uh to the glacier uh floor and this is a really great place to learn because it's as you see it's quite it's quite low down in terms of altitude but at the same time it gives us all these different formations that allow us to train in the different ways to, to use the crampons to use uh the ice axes of course and also to use the rope it's all a, it's a controlled environment so you know there, there, there there's very limited room for uh for things going wrong, which is why we like to use this location for training. It's actually, uh, it's actually uh, quite tame, but it's also still real mountain. So, you know, concentration is key and learning the skills. We push you to learn the skills in, a, in, a, in an environment that is controlled, but also uh, from a technical perspective, we'll be pushing you beyond what it is that you'll actually be needing for the Mont Blanc itself so that you feel comfortable. And, uh, and so, and that of course involves uh, all the different skills that are needed for the climb. So next day, uh, so we go back down to Chamonix, we spend the night over there, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is of course always included. Um, and then uh, the next day we leave Chamonix, we take a car uh, over to an area down the valley called Le Tour. And then from there we get on a cable car and then we start a trek up to the Albert Premier Hut. Um, the Albert Premier Hut is where we're going to be spending our first night in the high altitude environment. And it's going to be our opportunity to put our skills that we learned on the previous day to the test on an actual mountain. And, uh, and going to the hut is the first step towards going to the summit of that mountain. Um, the mountain is Aiguille de Tour, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment. Um, getting up to the glacier, uh, the Albert Premier Hut is right up on the glacier. It's a trek there, so there's no use of technical gear, but it's actually quite a big trek. It takes usually around three to three and a half hours uh, to reach the Albert Premier Hut. Uh, this is a view from the hut, so it's, as you can see, it sits right up on the glacier. It's quite spectacular, and we're looking here in the direction of Chamonix. So Chamonix is below us, and that would mean the Mont Blanc would be to our left-hand side directly from here. Uh, we'll be spending the night in the Albert Premier Hut. And it's not just about, you know, going to the huts is not just about, uh, you know, sleeping there and just for the summit, but it's also for you to get used to what it's like to be in the huts. Because, when, because the Albert Premier Hut, it's quite a big hut. It's not as crowded. Um, there are lots of routes, especially uh, uh, beginner routes that are accessed from this, from this space. So it's, a, it's an easy place to learn how to do things. It's an easy place to... To, you know, make mistakes, to, uh, to uh, put our gear, you know, le learn how to put our gear, how to be in the mountain hut. Uh, because later on, when we move over to the Momo side, you know, there's less room for that. There's just a lot more people, a lot more, like you just have to know, you have to put your gear here, move your stuff there, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and the people just kind of expect you to know how to do things. So when you're in the Albert Premier hut, there's going to be a big learning experience as to how to be in the hut, where to put your bag, where to put your gear, how to act, how to, you know, where you sleep and all of that. And then it'll just become kind of a, uh, a, a second nature as we move on. 
So we're going to spend the night in the Albert Premier hut. And then the next morning, we're going to wake up super early. Uh, usually, we try to move around 3.30 from the hut. And we're going to be heading up to Aiguille du Tour, which is a 3,800 meter mountain. Uh, Aiguille du Tour is actually quite a wonderful mountain because it gives us a, a kind of a, an overview of everything that we're going to need in terms of skill sets and actually pushes us a little bit harder from a technical perspective. So as you can see here, we're going to have the glacier traverse. So that's crossing, that's crossing the glacier. Usually that happens quite early. This is our team heading up to Aiguille du Tour in 2019. Um, so you have, you have uh, portions of that, but you also have the more rocky, more technical parts. So where we actually take off our crampons because crampons are not needed on the rocks. And we're going to learn how to go up the steeper sections up to the summit. Uh, and the, this is great because on the Mont Blanc, we're going to have uh, all of it. So we're going to have trekking. We're going to have steep ascents uh, without the crampons or maybe with the crampons and steep ascent, depending on the conditions. And then uh, a glacier, like something like a glacier traverse, which is, which is towards the end, and some sharp ridges as we reach, get close to the summit. So this is a great place to train. Uh, and this is actually uh, the whole team in, our first team in 2019. This is our August team, uh, all on the summit of Aiguille du Tour. And you can see the Mont Blanc is tucked all the way at the back. It's the last summit you can see completely covered in snow. The first one that looks a little bit taller, but isn't because it's just closer, is the Aiguille Verte, which is also quite a spectacular mountain. So there's just, but these are all mountains within the Mont Blanc Massif. So um, the following day, we the, the, the day that we go up to the summit of Aiguille du Tour, we go all the way back down to Chamonix. Um, so we stop by the Albert Premier Hut, collect our things, whatever we've left over there, go all the way back down to Chamonix, spend the night in the hotel. The following day, we have a day of just rope techniques. So we're going to stay in the valley. We're going to go through uh, the, you know, uh, 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 how to use the ropes in different, search, in, in, in different circumstances. This is really kind of the, the educational element that doesn't require any physical exertion. And the reason why we do it is twofold. One, because you need to walk away with some knowledge beyond just, uh, you know, the crampons and the ice axe. You have to actually understand the ropes. This is key to mountaineering. And two, it also serves as a rest day for us. So uh, it gives us a full 24 hours in the valley to recover from the Aiguille du Tour, uh, uh, take our time, uh, have a proper lunch in the valley, have a proper dinner in the valley, sleep well, and then the following day we start our ascent of the Mont Blanc uh, going up to the summit. So once we're done with our rest day and our rope day, uh, the following day we wake up in the morning. Uh, not an early start, by the way. Uh, we usually tend to leave, uh, try to catch the, the, the cable, the Bellevue cable from Les Uches, uh, at around uh, uh, at around maybe 11, 11.30. Um, so the idea is that we want to head to the Tetrus hut. So you can see Chamonix down there, you follow the orange line, and that tells you exactly where we're going. So we take the cable to Bellevue, and then we take a train from Bellevue to Niedeg, and then from Niedeg to Tetrus is actually where we start to actually trek up the mountain. Um, this is the team leaving uh, from the train station, heading in the direction of uh, the Tetrus hut. Uh, as you can see, it's like the, the glaciers start pretty much right away. Uh, it's quite dry, so there aren't many trees down in the valley. There are a lot more trees up here. It's quite dry because we're already in the, in the, the higher altitude uh, environment. But the trek is spectacular. So even before we get to anywhere near the summit, we're going to be seeing views like these. Um, and it's, it's really something very special. I don't think that you ever see kind of sunrises and sunsets in the same way as you do from, from Tetrus and, and the trek up. Um, just outside the Tetrus hut, uh, there is the, the base camp. Um, depending on the situation in the camp, in the hut, we may use both. So we may be staying inside the hut for short dinner, like dinner and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, our, our social time is inside the hut. But depending on the conditions in the hut and the situation um, at that closer to the time, we'll determine whether we'll sleep in the hut or we'll sleep in the base camp. They are immediately adjacent. The base camp looks pretty cool, a little cooler than the hut, I have to say, although it does get a little bit colder at the base camp. And this is one of the shots that we took uh, in the Tetrus hut, uh, just, just outside Tetrus hut uh, after dinner. 
Tetrus is where we kind of all sit together and we do the briefing for the summit because the next morning we're actually going to wake up and go all the way to the summit. So depending on the pace of the team, uh, the team is of course broken down into two by twos. So depending on the pace of the rope party, we'll determine what time we actually leave the Tetrus hut. We've had teams that leave at midnight. We've had teams that, leave, that, that have left at three o'clock in the morning. It depends uh, on the pace of the, of the rope party. The, the aim is to reach the top and to enjoy the experience. It's not just to be the first or to, to, you know, to, to, to go to be, do it in a shorter amount of time. That's, that's, that's quite nonsensical. And you can see here, this is a view looking up the mountain and just at the very top of the dome on the left-hand side, away from the crowd, uh, you can actually see a little box there and that is the Gute hut, which we'll be stopping over on the way up. I'll get to that in a moment. So next day, summit day, big day. Uh, we wake up early in the morning. Uh, the first section that we have is the Grand Couloir, which is a rocky section uh, that is quite steep, but very manageable. Depending on conditions, we may do it without crampons. We may do it with crampons. It's the, the situation there can vary dramatically. I've done it with crampons, full crampons from the moment I left the Tetris hut. And I've also done it fully without crampons until I got to within moments from the Gute hut. So it really depends on that. But here we're talking about uh, roughly about 900 of vertical meters. So it's quite a big ascent, although it's a short space. The aim is to get to the Gute hut. To have a uh, to have a short break inside the hut, so we'll have a, we'll have maybe a small breakfast or just have some tea, depending on the situation and how we're feeling. And then from Goute Hut, we're going to push up to the Mont Blanc summit, uh, past the Dom de Goute, and then back down to the Goute Hut. And we'll be sleeping at the Goute Hut, not back down at the Tetris Hut. The Dom de Goute. The, the uh, interesting thing about the summit night is that you will be doing two mountains above 4,000 meters, because the Dom du Goutet is also a 4,000 meter summit, which is on our route. So we're actually going to summit one mountain, and then we're going to summit the next one, which is the Mont Blanc proper. And here you can see, this is just at the base of the Grand Couloir. It's very dramatic, very beautiful. Uh, this is kind of gives you a feel of what it's like to do that rocky section, which I was telling you about, which is the Grand, heading up the Grand Couloir. Uh, on, in the direction of the Gute Hut. So here we're between the two uh, sections. This is arriving to the Gute Hut. The Gute Hut is on the glacier. So it's it, for sure, once we hit the glacier, which is just the bottom to the left of the picture here, that's the very bottom of the glacier. So crampons are on, technical gear is on. And I'm actually taking a picture of our team that's just arriving to the Gute Hut. And I'm actually at the Gute Hut myself. So you can imagine, you get the idea of the proportions slightly. And then we start to head up the mountain. And it's quite, uh, it, it, actually the technical part of the Mont Blanc, the most difficult section of the Mont Blanc is before the Goutte Hut. After the Goutte Hut, the difficulty is just to keep pushing yourself up the mountain because of course you're going to be tired from having, having woken up so early. And it's, it's, it's just about keeping one foot in front of the other and to keep going and to keep going and to keep going. Um, there's no more hands on the rock. Uh, you don't even need a helmet at this point. You can leave your deposit your helmet uh, at uh, at the Gute hut because the ch there is no there's no nothing can fall on you um, at, on this section anymore. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite pictures that I've taken of our team. I was uh, so as we're getting up to the Mont Blanc, very close, we we approach something called the Moguls. The Moguls are a bunch of false summits where you go up. And then you have to go down and then you go up and then you have to go down. So people think that this picture was taken uh, from a drone, but actually I'm standing on top of a mogul in the direction of the summit. And this other one of our teams is going up the second mogul and I managed to get this kind of angle, but it gives you a bit of an idea of the perspective on the mountain. And uh, these are the moguls. So you can see you've got these, it's like, they're like a bunch of bumps uh, on the way up to the summit. And then finally, of course, you have the summit ridge, which is this spectacular uh, scene where you have a, a gigantic drop on your right-hand side, gigantic drop on your left-hand side, and it's about walking on this ridge, of course, with the crampons roped into your, uh, your, uh, your mountain guide who, who will be instructing you on how to do this safely. And uh, it's quite spectacular. So here on the right-hand side, you've got uh, 3,000 vertical meters down into France. And on the left-hand side, you've got 3,000 uh, 3, vertical meters down into Italy. And you're just right on the border, which is this ridge that, we, that we're walking on. 
it's quite special. And uh, this is one of our teams as well uh, on the summit of the Mont Blanc. Uh, in, and it, yeah, always great to be at the top, always great to, to have a good weather. This is a, this is a good weather day. Um, and you can see, cause you know, gloves are off and you know, nothing's on our faces and we all look pretty warm. So it's quite, uh, quite a nice thing. Um, so then the, the, the final mountain day is for us to go from the Gute Hut. We wake up super early in the morning and we head down uh, straight to Tetrus and then to Nideg. It usually takes around three to four hours in total, um, but that can vary depending on conditions. Uh, we've been very lucky with conditions on the Grand Couloir, so uh, that enables us to go a little bit faster, but in some cases it might take longer. The idea is that we want to catch uh, the train before they close. Um, uh, they usually close between 3 and 4 p.m., depending on the day, um, so that we can then get the cable from Bellevue back down to Chamonix. Once we're in Nideg, it's over. Uh, there's, no more, uh, there's no more walking. We just have to, we're just taking transport and then another transport down uh, to Chamonix. And finally, we'll have our, uh, our celebratory dinner in Chamonix with everybody, pull out the champagne, and, uh, and just uh, look at pictures from an epic experience that we've had together. Uh, voila, that's it. So, uh, so here we are, and that's, the, that's pretty much the, the, uh, the, the kind of the, the down low of, uh, of the entire uh, trip. Uh, please feel free to drop your questions into the chat box if you uh, would like to um, uh, send the messages directly to me. Uh, you can definitely do that without having to message the entire group. Otherwise, um, you can uh, just message the entire group as well. It's, it's all good. But uh, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read out the questions so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, although I won't mention who is, uh, is sending um, the, uh, the questions. So uh, a couple of quick ones uh, as I'm waiting for you guys to drop your questions in. Um, the, the, uh, the trip, so all, all meals are included in the trip, the photography on the trip. So every single picture that you've seen in this, uh, in this presentation is, uh, uh were taken by us on our trips. Um, and that's actually very much part of, uh, what we, what we like to do is, um, I've got my Sony RX10 <laughs> that's what I've been using. And I like to get up there. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of an independent uh, photographer on this particular trip. So you, you'll be led directly by the guides. And what I, my role when you're climbing is to be your photographer and to, and to catch you in different moments. And, and having that flexibility enables me to get far enough to get some, some of those bigger shots that, that you've seen um, that you won't be able to do because you're roped up to your, uh, to your guide and to your climbing partner. Uh, of course, in the valley, uh, I'm, I'm going to be personally taking care of you uh, from the moment you uh, step off the plane in Geneva Airport until you're dropped back off at Geneva Airport again. Uh, so that includes uh, checking you into the hotel, uh, making sure that everything is going okay, taking you guys for your rental gear, um, and of course coordinating with the guides to make sure that you guys are all as comfortable as, uh, as possible. So uh, I'm going to get to some of the questions as well. Um, so one of the, the this is a very like a recurring question, is uh, about altitude sickness. Um, is altitude is altitude sickness an issue? Uh, a lot of you guys would have been you know lo been looking into this trip probably after having done something like Kilimanjaro, which is a trek. No, no nothing technical, but it's much higher. Excuse me. So. Um, Kiliman, uh, you know, Kilimanjaro is 1,000 meters higher into the air than uh, the Mont Blanc. Um, having said that, uh, any mountain this high uh, does present altitude issues, which is why we, uh, we do an acclimatization. So we have, uh, we're acclimatizing at three points, actually four points on this trip. The first acclimatization takes place when we do the, when we do the training on the Mer de Glace. Uh, the second thing uh, that we do, that we, where we acclimatize, is when we are at, spending the night at the Albert Premier Hut. The third is, of course, when we go to Aiguille de Tour, and the fourth is the night we spend at Tetrus. Uh, just to understand what acclimatizing is, it is your body getting used to the altitude. So what that means is basically, as we go up into altitude, there is less oxygen um, because the pressure is reduced in the atmosphere. So that doesn't mean that I, I'm going. You don't feel anything. Your air fills up with 
your your lungs fill up with air just as as they would anywhere else in, you know on any on any altitude but the density of the of the of the gases in your each uh, inhalation is less so that means less oxygen your body reacts to that by producing more red blood cells uh, in order to compensate for the less oxygen that each red, red blood cell is taking to the various parts of your body. So uh, the act of acclimatization is to trigger your body into producing red blood cells early so that you can, so that when we go up into altitude, the, the, your, your body is already uh, physiologically ready to deal with the less oxygen in the higher altitude environment. So that's what it is. Of course, uh, the team is like fully uh, capable of recognizing serious issues of altitude, and we handle them as we uh, as as we go along. But we've we very rarely had issues of acclimatization because this itinerary is not a rushed itinerary. We're not you know you don't it's not that you have three days and we've got to get you up the mountain and down in, in that limited amount of time. We have a full week together, so we can take full advantage of that to to couple our training with acclimatization. Um, got a question here. Uh, about fitness preparation um, and recommendations for fitness levels required. Okay, so um, this is a very tricky one because um, uh, fitness, like if fitness is a relative thing. Um, I've seen people who are uh, extremely fit, like even they work as personal trainers who have been like, okay, this is really like at the edge of what I'm physically capable of doing. And I've seen people who've got a beer belly from their chin to the floor and, you know, they crack open a beer on the summit. So it's, it, it really, it's, it, I would say actually your, what the, the first point uh, or the starting point is wanting it. If you want it, then you will be able, like, you will, you will understand what you have to do to make it possible for yourself. Uh, and then, and, and that's where all preparation needs to start. It needs to start from actually wanting it. Um, and then from there, we start to move into, okay, uh, what, how, how will my physical ability buttress my mental strength? Because at the end of the day, anybody can put one foot in front of the other, but it's the mind that fails. And this becomes a this becomes the question of fitness because the, the the stronger you feel you are between you and yourself, the stronger your mind is going to be to want to push you up that mountain uh, and push you into difficult conditions as well. So um, I would say that it's it's very important for you to feel strong. It's important for you to feel strong. Um, we 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 do give out a uh, like a, a recommendation list of, of of home exercises that we feel are great for this kind of thing um, that focus on the areas that a lot of people don't necessarily focus on. So for me, it doesn't matter how many sprints you can do. As, you know, I need I I uh, what, or or burpees you can do. Or what I what I would want to see, or what I think would be the most important thing, is to be able to kind of create stamina, to be able to last. For, for as long as possible. Um, and, and here, I think uh, getting out there and doing some local treks helps a lot. Uh, doing some jogging helps a lot. Getting into some swimming might also uh, help a lot, especially with the breathing. Um, but what I would say focus on mostly is actually your core and your lower body. And the best thing to do for core is actually to, uh, is, are things like um, uh, doing the plank. Because, Muscles are going to ache no matter what. So on the very first day, and this is quite typical, I remember my first day when I first went up to, to, to climb, actually to, to come to the Mont Blanc. And uh, after the, the first day of training, my legs were so sore because there's, there's no training in the world that trains you to strengthen the inner side of your uh, of your of your uh, of your calf muscle like on a on a at an angle that you would never really imagine you 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 didn't even know you could train that um but the way the angle at which you wear the crampons and the way you have to walk pushes your your body in in places that are that are quite different so it's natural that on the second day and possibly even the third day you're going to feel sore and that's normal but if you if your back like your lower back fails that's something that won't go away with, you know, it's not just regular muscle soreness. Um, that's something that'll actually be quite debilitating. So, and the best way to avoid that is to 
uh, is to work on your core and to, to work on, um, on, on isometric exercises. So things like holding the plank. Uh, but we will send you over uh, uh, our fitness guide and our nutrition guide as well. Those two things can be incorporated into your daily life and your daily routine. I wouldn't say, you know, sit there and be like, okay, I've got to be like an athlete and this is how it's going to happen. No, because I don't know if you noticed in the pictures, but nobody, nobody over there is, a, <laughs> is an Olympic athlete. They're all just kind of regular people who uh, have pushed themselves a little bit more uh, in, their, in their routine to prepare themselves because you have to do something like that. It's also good for your mental fortitude, but you don't, don't think of it as, you know, there's like a certain number of burpees I have to do before I can do this. It doesn't, it really doesn't work that way. I hope I answered your question. I know it's quite a long, long answer, but this is really important, I, I feel. Right, so uh, question is, uh, how much training does an individual need to be ready to take this trip regardless of technical training? And we'll, uh, okay, uh, right. I'm just going to read. I'm just going to uh, read it quickly and then uh, read it out to you. Okay, so somebody here is asking me about technical training. Um, so, okay, so what, what kind of uh, how much training does somebody need to take a trip? Um, and uh, and and like irrespective of technical training, what's a good terrain to to, to train in? Of course, if you have access to high altitude environments, that's wonderful. Uh, and high altitude environment can be anything. So it's just, just not like, think of it this way, just not at sea level, right? And varied terrain. So let's say if we were like, you know, if, you're, if you have access to, uh, to mountains above 2000 meters, that's spectacular. Do all your, like do whatever you can up there. Uh, go for treks, uh, go for walks, uh, do some trail running, uh, walk your dog up there. That's the best, that's the best training. It's just to be up there. Uh, for those of us who don't have access to higher mountains, uh, I don't know, of course, sorry, just uh, to, to continue with the, the higher mountains. Also, if you have access to snowy areas, that's also great as well. Put on some um, some snowshoes and just go and do some walking on the snow if you if you can. That's great. That'll just get your body used to the to the motion. Um, for those of us who don't have access, uh, it's you know th there it doesn't make or break anything. Um, what it does do is that it just you just have to be a bit more creative. So uh, if we have access to a desert, it'd be great to walk up and down some dunes sometimes. If we have access to, uh, to, uh, to some rocky areas or some crags, some of us don't even have access to anything other than an indoor climbing gym. And you know what? If that's what's going to work for you, then just go and do it. There, are, there is no one size that fits all. Um, any terrain that is a little bit different, something that's a bit you know, closer to, you know, gives you, gives you some variation, ups and downs, rocks, sand, whatever, snow, if you have access to that as well, that's the, that's the best place to train. And, uh, and I would say just get out there, do some trekking, do some hiking. If you have access to a rock climbing gym or a rock climbing group, that's also a good place to go to just get used to, you know, putting on ropes and doing some little, little rock climbing um, sections. That's also quite fun. But I, I say that from a perspective of that would be ideal and it's quite fun. I wouldn't say that this is like it makes or breaks anything uh, with regards to, to this trip. Fitness is just about, like I said from the beginning, it's fitness of the mind and whatever you need to do to feel confident and comfortable when you step off the plane in Geneva, that's where you should go. Um, right. So I've got a question about somebody who's asked me if they could uh, about meeting points. So, uh, yes. Uh, oh, perfect. Yeah. If you can meet in Chamonix, uh, that's perfect. We'll send you the details of the hotel that we stay in and uh, you can meet us straight there because that's the meeting that we basically, what we do is we shuttle people from Geneva airport up to Chamonix. We check them into the hotel and, uh, and then they, they'll be like, you know, some free time to wander around the town and things like that. So we'll make the meeting point the, ho the, the hotel as well. So if you're coming in by car, that's, that's even better. Uh, no issues there. Um, got another question here is, uh, can we get a hold of the recording? Yes, of course. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll be sending you guys a recording of the session. Um, so you'll have it there. Uh, we'll also be giving out a small little, uh, uh, uh thing to all of you guys who attended, which is, uh, a little, uh, a little promo code that you can use when booking this trip. So you hopefully will go ahead and use that. Uh, I won't tell you what it is yet. You'll get it in your email a little later tonight. Uh, right. Uh, another question here is, um, 
Uh, okay, I think that was a follow-up question uh, about, uh, okay, so frequency of training. Uh, like I said, just on the pre, uh, you know, just to continue from the previous point, it, um, it you just have to, uh, uh, it, like I said, it's, it's in the mind. So if you feel like a, like a three, three times a week frequency is something that's great for you, great. If you feel like once a week to get up into the altitude and then maybe a couple of days of, 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 of training or running in, in your neighborhood, that's also great. Whatever you feel comfortable with, that's what's important. And on an individual basis, I'm, we're super happy to, to, to discuss with you, you know, where you are and where you need to go. Um, because of course, what I'm talking about is quite generic. Uh, if, 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 if your personal circumstances are one in which you can, you know, you find it difficult to go from the ground floor to the first floor apartment by the stairs, that's a different conversation that we need to have. But we have time still between now and next summer in order to prepare for that. So that's the good thing about doing this, this sort of stuff super early. But we'll work on individual circumstances and feel free to reach out to us about your particular circumstances and how best to train uh, given your background. Right. Uh, did anything surprise you about the trail the first time you went? Um, for me, not necess not particularly, because I kind of I, I made a very conscious choice uh, very early on. I, I was familiar with the Mont Blanc. I used to, you know, I I, I grew up in the in the region, so uh, I'm very familiar with the environment, and I was kind of I knew what to more or less what to expect. I'd seen it before from afar. Um, never actually climbed it before, but up until my first time, of course. Um, but I can say that it has people who have been with us on this trip um, in the early days when we first started to do it did get a little bit surprised because most of them would have come from a background of, um, of trekking. And this, was, this is usually an opportunity to put on crampons for the very first time. And, this is, and, and so when you're in a technical mountain, it's different from being uh, on, you know, with your just with your regular trekking shoes, because we're, you know, on Kilimanjaro, we can stop at any time, take some pictures at any moment, take a break at any moment. Uh, once our technical gear is on, that's no longer possible, uh, because the mountain. What, what's basically happening is that we now have other elements that are factored into our equation. For example, we can't stop on the Grand Couloir at certain sections because there is. Um, there is a risk of rockfall in certain places and we're aware of where those sections are. So just because you're tired in that moment doesn't mean that we can stop in that moment. We have to move to a safe space. Um, same thing could be when we're crossing a glacier. If we know that this is, there, is, there, is a, there is a potential for crevasse, which are air pockets within the glacier, and you are, uh, you know, and, and, we, and you see that this is a, like you want to take a picture over there and we, you know, the guides feel that this, it's not a safe space to do that in, then we, we can't, you know, we can't do that. So it's a bit more, I think uh, people tend to get uh, a little bit, uh, you know, expectations uh, get rocked a little bit in the first couple of days when they realize that, okay, this is not as, you know, as, as, uh, as relaxed in terms of I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. This is it's much more regimented. Um, and, and that's, but that's the nature of, of alpine mountaineering. It's once you put on crampons, once you're in an environment in which the mountain has more say in what it is that you can and can't do, it becomes more regimented. And your, and your guide, who is super nice, and it wants you to have the time of your life, but above all of that, wants you to be safe. And so there are decisions that, will be made that at some time at some points uh may you may feel like okay but i you know i really wanted to do this and and the guide may may disagree with that and and that can sometimes uh, uh be a little bit uh difficult to understand of course by the by the time we get to you know a couple of days in people understand more and more but this is i think this is kind of the key it's not so much the terrain as much as it is the way in which alpine mountaineering runs as opposed to a trekking adventure i hope i answered your question um, okay, okay, cool question. All right, so, so we've got two questions, uh, 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 actually one question uh, that has two answers, uh, which is when are we going to uh, actually do this trip? So we have uh, two experiences uh, that we have coming up in 2021 for this. Uh, we have our 27th of August to 4th of September, 
and our 4th of September to 12th of September. We don't offer the Mont Blanc, like actually being on the Mont Blanc in the month of August. We know that it's super popular to do that, but we don't do it because of uh, two reasons. One, because Europe has been experiencing heat waves in the, in the middle of August, which have made the glacier unstable. And, to, and based on my discussions with our guides, uh, we've determined that it is unsafe uh, to be able to offer this in August anymore for, for, for you know, in, in the way that we do. Um, so we decided that September, there are less people on the mountain. Uh, there are the, the, the chances of a heat wave are far reduced. So the glacier is a bit more stable. Um, and that's why we decide, we decide to do it, uh, it mostly in the September months. So uh, the, even our 27th of August, it starts on the 27th of August, but we don't actually get onto the mountain until uh, on the Mont Blanc itself until the 2nd of September. So that gives us that window um, to be able to work with. September is a very good month. Uh, we've had most of our success in that month. And, uh, and so we're very kind of committed to that month in terms, of, in terms of this mountain. We do do other Alpine experiences in August and in July, um, including our introduction to Alpine mountaineering and our Chamonix to Zermatt Haute Route and our, uh, our uh, Matterhorn climbs. Uh, but we've, so, but what we've done is we've just kind of plugged everything where we feel it's safest to do it based on the mountains that we're doing and where they are. So there are things that we can do in August that are safe, uh, but we feel that Mont Blanc is not one of them. Um, right. Oh, uh, on, on that note, uh, just uh, the 27th of August, the 4th of September, we only have one space left on that trip. Um, the 4th of September to the 12th of September, we got four spaces on that trip. So we're, we're much more flexible. We only take six people on this trip in total. And when we're climbing the Mont Blanc, it's for every guide, there are two people. So two of you will be with one guide uh, for, the, for, the, for the Mont Blanc section. Right. Um, Another question is, what if the weather is bad on the top? Do we have another try? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and the answer is, it depends. Uh, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, weather is an act of God. It's out of everybody's hands and nobody can plan for it. Um, we have two contingencies that we, uh, that we do in the event of weather. Uh, the first one is if the weather is just bad on one particular day, we are flexible with our itinerary because we do have a rest day. So we can move the rest day around in a way so that we can actually try and make the, uh, make the summit of the Mont Blanc. Of course, if we feel that it's too risky or the, the, the window is too short for us to be able to do it uh, in, the, in the week that we've allotted for this, then we look at doing a comparable summit that is where, where the weather is better. Good thing about being in the Alps is that we can get into our vehicle and drive uh, to pretty much as far as we need to go in order to, to get a decent, uh, to get a good summit that is comparable. Um, typically, we go into the Aosta Valley and do the Gran Paradiso, which is also a big 4,000er. Um, and that's usually the weather uh, in the Southern Alps in September can be a little bit better, especially if there's a system in the Mont Blanc area, it tends to drag things away from the Southern Alps. So uh, it really depends on the situation, but uh, we do have two contingencies. The first, our uh, first, like our, 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 the plan A is to stick to the plan. Plan B is to alternate the days so that the Mont Blanc is still possible uh, within, within our itinerary week. So alternate what we're doing within our week uh, and how we allot the different days. And plan C is to then move to a comparable mountain and, uh, and, and climb there instead. Uh, which is also a great achievement. Uh, Grand Paradiso is a great achievement uh, by every stretch. Right. Um, I hope I answered that question as well. Uh, do you recommend uh, continuing the trip to go around the whole Mont Blanc ring? Uh, I could do both trips, climb and do the Tour de Mont Blanc at the same time. Right. So Tour de Mont Blanc, for those of you guys who don't know, I'll just, uh, just so that I, people know what I'm, what I'm talking about, is the trek. It's a trek. It's not a climb. And it goes around the whole Mont Blanc Massif. So remember, I, got, I showed you guys that the Mont Blanc is the highest mountain, and then you have, it's part of the Massif, which is the large collection of mountains. So, um, and we offer the Tour de Mont Blanc, which is the trek that goes around it. Uh, it's a 170 kilometer trek. Uh, we do it in, uh, the, the whole trip that we do is, uh, I believe, nine days in total. Um, and it is very possible because as it happens, we, we wrap up on our uh, uh, 
September Mont Blanc summit and start our Tour de Mont Blanc the exact following day. Um, so we the fourth. I'm talking here about the fourth of September to the twelfth of September. So it is super possible for you to do that, um, and it depends on your on 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 how you're feeling um, and if you feel like you're fit to do something like that. I mean, I do it right, but this is kind of my job. So um, I do, you know, I, I and and uh, it's something that I I feel like the Tour de Mont Blanc coming off the Mont Blanc kind of feels like a nice. You know, it's like a nice cool down uh, in terms of uh, in terms of physical exertion because you know there are no more mountain huts. We kind of sleep in uh, in nice hotels every night, and uh, the trail is very tame. And the you know we're we're we're, we're having uh, dinners in the villages every night, so it's a different experience to like a technical mountain climb where we eat whatever uh, you know uh, Monsieur Antoine at the Goutte Hut decides to feed us that night. So it's a bit of a different experience. Um, so I hope I answered that question. It is absolutely possible, but you just need to consider your own physical uh, uh, kind of abilities. And if you're if you if you feel like after a trip like Mont Blanc, you'd be capable of going for it, I certainly do. My fiance does it as well, so it, it is it is within the realm of possibility. Um, got another question here, which is um, okay, food intolerances. Uh, Right, so we are able to, so if you have food intolerances, uh, when you book, you please just reach out to, to us by email. Also, in any case, when you book, we do um, send out uh, an email, an introductory email, and it has all the details, and it includes uh, dietary restrictions. So if you have dietary restrictions, it's important for you to let us know. Gluten is an issue. If you have a the gluten intolerance issue, this is that is an issue because <laughs> we're in France, <laughs> you know. So it's it's all it's all about bread and croissant and all of that. Um, but we can make but we can always make it work. Um, there's there we will we'll have a discussion uh, with what is possible uh, for you, and we can uh, we can work around it. Uh, you definitely don't need to bring your own food. Um, and we have regular access to things like supermarkets as well, even when we're doing the Mont Blanc Summit. Like, as you, as you know from the itinerary, we're only doing, we're only, we're only actually not spending the night in Chamonix. There are actually three nights in the whole itinerary where we're up in the mountains. Every other night is spent in Chamonix, which means we have access to supermarkets, we have access to restaurants. So uh, that's, that's not an issue. In the mountain huts, uh, we just need to let them know uh, well ahead, uh, ahead of time. Uh, that's for gluten intolerance. Um, it, of course, vegetarian options are usually available. Vegan options can be a slight issue, depending on where we are. Um, it is possible, but we need to we do need to know well ahead of, of time. And the worst case scenario with, uh, with with vegan options is that we would bring the food with us, but we will handle that. That's not something that you need to worry about. Uh, you just need to let us know what your restrictions are, and we will handle it logistically. Um, right. So, uh, okay. Uh, got one more, uh, question here. Uh, this one is about, uh, so we're going back to training and, um, for somebody who already runs, uh, works out often, rock climbs, uh, what is the specific training? So we, I just said earlier, uh, with the team that, um, what you, what we, we provide a fitness program that you can do at home. Uh, ultimately, there is no one size fits all for something like this. If you already rock climb and you're already a runner, these are it, that's that's great. What and I don't think you'd actually need to do more than that. Um, our fitness program is just to help you target some things that you don't think about, like your core, in order to support your lower back. Um, so it's more more kind of targeted things that you should uh, you should incorporate, but not something to substitute your fitness regime. For. If you're already a rock climber, you already do regular workouts, you're already a runner, then I would say you are beyond probably even me <laughs> in terms of fitness. Probably, yeah, anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much. But if you are concerned uh, for yourself, please just reach out to me personally. Um, you can just drop, uh, drop me a message or drop us an email and uh, we can have that discussion one to one. But um, yeah, it's just kind of. Uh, yeah, the, in terms of fitness, like I was saying earlier to the to everyone else, uh, it's a it's a mind over matter thing. So I've seen athletes who couldn't make it, and I've seen people with beer bellies, like I said, from the chin to the floor, who you know who made it just fine. It's uh it's about where you are in terms of your mental strength to push yourself through the difficult times because and 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 physical strength has a lot to do with it, but that's relative. So some people will feel strong for doing less, and some people will feel weak for do it after doing more. 
it really depends on the individual and I'm happy to, to, to discuss that with you uh, further. Uh, guys, I'm uh, coming to the end of the questions here. So uh, if anybody has any further questions, uh, feel free to drop them in before we, uh, before we end the session. Um, but uh, just to kind of wrap up on everything, if you, if you ever have any questions about this trip or any other trip, please do feel free to reach out to us. We absolutely love to talk about mountains. We love to have this discussion. It's, it's really, it's, it's, we, we, we do this because, you know, out of, out of, uh, out of the sheer joy of, of bringing people like you to these places and watching you experience this for the very first time. It's, uh, it, it, that's what brings us a lot of pleasure. So please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you have any questions about gear, if you have any questions about, uh, about uh, flights, uh, getting in, uh, all of that, we are more than happy to support you in any way that we can. Um, just, to, just a quick heads up, we only have one space left on our 27th of August to 4th of September Mont Blanc Summit trip. And we have four spaces left on our 4th of September to 12th of September trips. We'll be sending you guys out an email uh, once this is done with your uh, special promo code uh, so that you can, uh, you can use that when you want to book. The promo code is valid for a month, so uh, no rush. But we do operate on a first-come, uh, first-serve basis. So uh, don't wait too long because this is one of our, kind of our most popular trips and we don't have that many spaces for it. Having said that, have a wonderful evening, and I'm super looking forward to sharing uh, the Mont Blanc, Chamonix, and the Alps with you guys next summer. Have a wonderful time. Take care. <laughs>